Um, today we're going to re review some of the concepts we talked about last time and then get into the .NET platform. Um, the main uh, thrust of, of last lecture was talking about dynamic web pages and how they vary from static web pages. And the, the basic idea is that if you're taking something and, and your page just isn't like an electronic brochure, you know, whereas instead of having a brochure printed on paper, you have web pages, like the early web pages were. Your page does more than that. If you have search functionality, for example, if you have customization depending on who is logged on, like Angel, for example, if you um, allow the user to enter and process data, like maybe eBay or Amazon, any of those things, standard plain old HTML just isn't going to cut it, right? Because HTML doesn't have any, any facility to do that. Instead, the idea is each page is custom created for the user based on the request. And several pieces come together when a request is made for a dynamic page. And therefore, we had this diagram up last time where we have the client connected through the internet to a web server. Client is someone running a browser, all right? The internet is the internet. And the web server is the system that responds to requests from web pages, for web pages. So that's where the web pages live. And in the case of static HTML, it's real straightforward. The, the web server simply locates the file and sends it on its way, all right? Um, but again, those pages, uh, if you look, if you, if you think of any site that you visit on a regular basis, there's a real good chance that it's not a static page, that it's somehow a dynamic page. All right? Those dynamic pages are still in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Sometimes I'll just abbreviate by saying an HTML document, implying that all those things are in it. Those pages still get delivered to the client as an HTML, CSS, JavaScript document, because that's what browsers need. That's what browsers can display. All right. However, those pages aren't simply sitting out there waiting to be delivered. They are created on the fly. They are assembled. And those can be assembled from a number of different uh, ingredients or components. First of all, a request, again, consists of a URL, and it consists of some user-entered parameters. You know, pretty much anything that you would enter on a form, for example, would be a user-entered parameter. So when you log on to Angel, you put in your username and password, that goes along with the request as part of the request. Yes? I don't remember if you said this. Does it include things that we don't enter on purpose? Like, um, I don't know, you know how they collect things about you, like your location, like whatever you know? Yeah, the request actually contains a lot of stuff. Okay. All right? So, for example, it knows the IP that you're coming from, the IP address. Using the IP address, it can get a sense of the location of where you're at. All right? It's not always right with that, by the way. Um, for a while at home, every time I went to Google, I would get uh, Google UK, because for some reason it misinterpreted my IP address and thought I was in the UK. All right? When I just reset my router, I got another IP address and it worked. All right? But it was kind of kind of funny for a while. But essentially, yeah, that request, there's some other stuff that comes with it. But probably most relevant for our discussion is the user-entered parameters. An example of the other stuff, again, the location, or from what it can glean the location, um, is that uh, when you do a search in Google, you get localized results. So if you search for a restaurant, you'll get 
restaurants in this area. Yes, it would include what browser you're using, what operating system. Sometimes if you go to a page to like download uh, an application, download, let's say, Google Chrome, <clears throat> it knows if you're on a Windows machine or a Mac, and therefore it displays only the appropriate link. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of other stuff that can come along with, with that request. That's one ingredient, the parameters that you supply. All right? Because the idea here is you're not writing complete web pages. You're writing instructions to create web pages. Those instructions are called server-side scripts, typically. And again, in this discussion, we're talking about sort of the generic uh, model. This isn't any platform-specific. Later on today, we'll get into stuff specific to ASP.NET. So, a good generic term for these would be scripts, programs, that take your user input and interact with maybe a database server, that's supposed to say server, and maybe some other stuff. You know, um, other scripts. For example, um, let's say you go to, um, you know, the, 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 the city of Orlando's web page, or the city of Orlando Chamber of Commerce. It's possible that that page interacts with maybe the weather channel's web service, so it can show you it is now, you know, 85 and sunny in Orlando or whatever. So can interact with other stuff as well. We don't really focus on this stuff, but I think it's important to mention. Really, the stuff that we're going to be most interested in is this stuff over here. Creating the scripts that takes the user input, works with the database to generate then an HTML document that gets sent back to the server. <clears throat> One thing that's worth mentioning, and, and we will talk about it a little bit, but the bulk of this class is focused on the server-side stuff, but the role of server-side scripting is to generate web pages. We can sort of amend that to say the role of server-side scripting is to generate web pages and generate other web content. But in traditional model of web pages, the purpose of server-side scripting is to generate, is to create web pages and deliver them to the browser. We also have client-side scripting. All right? Client-side scripting being JavaScript. And although it's scripting, it serves a very different role. All right? If you request a page, you will get delivered the HTML, the CSS, and JavaScript. The role of JavaScript is to alter existing pages. Now, what do I mean by that and what's the advantage of doing it that way? The advantage of doing it that way is, since this script is loaded when the original page is loaded, <clears throat> The JavaScript can work and it can alter a page <clears throat> instantaneously because you don't have to travel back through the internet and back to get your updates to the page. So like a lot of mouse over effects are done via JavaScript. You put your mouse over a link, maybe in a submenu appears. All right? Oftentimes that's implemented in, in JavaScript. All right? And typically that happens instantaneously. Why? Because if it didn't happen instantaneously, then that effect wouldn't be very good, right? 
if you had to wait every time you put your mouse over something for it to go to the server, get some content, and come back, all right, and refresh the entire page. So the idea of JavaScript then is we have a page loaded, but we can make the page a little more interactive. We can add some interactivity to it by putting some JavaScript into it. Again, I'm, I'm speaking in, in generalities. JavaScript serves other roles as well, but this is a main one. The, the win of JavaScript is that, from the user's perspective, they will get an immediate response. All right. From a client's perspective, or um, yeah, from the user's perspective, they'll get an immediate response. From the server's perspective, the server isn't bothered with these little things that the client can do just as well on their own. Yes. And then we covered a little about 216, and you gave mm -hmm. an example of those mm -hmm. over like a news right. site or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, typically. Again, do keep in mind that almost anything I can say, there's a million ways to do it, right? But a typical way that would be done is that HTML, when it came over, would include the basic HTML for the page and all the stuff that was hidden as well. All right? And then, based on the user's action, stuff would be shown and, and hide it, hidden. All right? Um, so yeah, that, that's, that would be one way to do that. There's other ways to do it as well, but um, that, that would be one way. All right, so let's see. Anything else regarding this? All right, let's talk a little bit more specifically about the ASP.NET platform. All right? If you think about web pages, all right, there's a lot of things that are on many different web pages. All right? You know, mouse over menus are on a lot of, different, lot of, a lot of web pages. Right? You put your mouse over a menu and, and something pops up. That's on a lot of web pages. Calendars are on a fair number of web pages. Um, validation of form data, that is to make sure that the user enters the proper values in the fields. That's done on, it should be done on any, on any, on any page that has a form, that has user input. You should validate it. We could go on and on and on and come up with a list of some things that happen on an awful lot of web pages. All right? That's where ASP.NET comes in. Programmers in the old days, and again, depending on your perspective and, and depending on what context you're talking about, the old days could be like, you know, 2000, or the old days could be the 80s or, or whatever. Programmers in the old days could be viewed as, you know, craftsmen that made every one of their uh, products custom crafted, you know. When I studied programming first, that's how it was, right? We would go and we would, anything we needed, we had to write, all right? So any code you needed, we had to write, all right? Now, if you had to do that same thing again, you either had to write it again or kind of figure out a way to reuse it, all right? But you were on your own, all right? You were on your own as a craftsman to sort of develop the solutions the way that you uh, needed to. You didn't really get a jump start, you know. It, you, know you, you were pretty much starting every project from ground zero, other than, well, maybe you could leverage some of the knowledge that you have from the past in doing this. Yes? Would you be able to write down a copy of your code before you... Use it, take yeah, well, that's, that's, that's what I said. It. You would have to do that, though. Yeah. There's nothing built into the system that would do that. That would be something that you would have to discipline yourself to do and, and, and do it. And the problem with that, then, is someone else is working on similar projects, depending on how well you communicated, might be doing it your, you know, their way as well. And you might have the same thing done a couple slightly different ways. Something changes, there's a bug, you're, you, you end up with a mess. All right? 
So the idea was, wasn't that, you, you know, people weren't clever back then and that people didn't figure out some ways to, to, uh, to work through this and make their lives a little bit easier. But there's nothing like built in to uh, the system or to the environment, probably a better way to put it, that would make this easy. You were on your own to do it. All right, so companies created libraries of functions and, and individual people created their own libraries of code and so on and so forth, but it was up to you to create it. And, and again, the analogy that a lot of people give is that's like, that's like a craftsman. Yeah, a craftsman might have developed some tricks of the trade over years, but essentially they're crafting everything custom. All right, what do we know about uh, sort of craftsman work. Craftsman work is, is, is long. Craftsman work is expensive. Um, it, it has the potential to be fraught with mistakes. Um, it, it's hard for someone to jump in and take over for what someone else is doing. It, it, it lends itself to sort of a, a, a style of programming that doesn't work well in a business environment where things change very fast and you have to make changes all the time, uh, etc. So what happened in the world of manufacturing? Well, there was standardization, you know, and interchangeable parts and assembly lines and all that sort of stuff. I guess the analogy in programming was that there were, libra that there were libraries and frameworks created. All right? What are frameworks? Frameworks are tools or sets of tools, sets of components, all right, that you can reuse and you can plug them in where you're needed to do a certain function, to do a certain piece of functionality. Now, well, let's think of some of the advantages of doing that. The advantages of doing that, first off, right off the bat, is some of your work is done for you. Well, gee, that's good news, right? All right. Some of your work is done for you, so, for example, if I want to include a calendar on my page, all right, in an ASP.NET application, there's a calendar control, there's a calendar component that I just pop on my page, and there you go. I don't have to write it myself. It's there. The advantage of that, again, is first of all, it did some of the work for me. Second of all, if I'm part of a team and everyone's doing it that way, there's consistency. I look at your calendar, you look at mine, we're using the same component, all right? The other thing is there's a real good chance that whoever developed that component did a more thorough, more complete job of testing it than you would probably do with your code. Right? Not to say that there's never bugs in components or never bugs in frameworks, but there's a good chance that there's more thorough testing done, all right? So it's a standardized way of doing things. All right, makes it easy to reuse, easy to look at someone else's code and understand it. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone's doing it their own way. And the things that a lot of web applications have in common are done for you. You just maybe have to configure the component a little bit. All right? So your job isn't then of a craftsman. Your job is more of like an engineer, you know, an engineer building a circuit board. You know, they don't... Uh, custom, you know, I imagine they don't anyhow, they don't custom make their own transistors. You know, they go and they grab a transistor that they need. They go and grab a RAM chip that they need. You know, all these sorts of things they'll go and there's already a component, so they don't have to do that. You know, like the old saying, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a component created for something, fine, we can use it. Now, to be sure, all right, um, the framework doesn't do all your work for you. Just because you have a pile of electronic components doesn't mean your circuit board gets built automatically. You've got to do some work. You've got to assemble it. You might have to configure some of the components. You might have to figure out something that's unique about your particular project and implement that. Similar idea with software. Just because there's components, that's giving you a, a jump start, right? That'd be like using a template <coughs> word, right? Template word for a business letter doesn't write the business letter for you. But it makes sure that there's a spot for the address and a spot for the greeting and so on down the line. So in a way, it, makes you, it gives you a jump start. It, it, it makes it a little easier for you. In a nutshell, that's what the .NET platform is. Is there are, and again, I'm going to take this diagram and tweak it 
to be more ASP specific, ASP.NET specific. In addition to, well, we'll keep this as scripts programs and I'll change it. In addition to that, there's a whole set of, actually, I'm not going to draw it this way. There's a whole set of .NET components. What are .NET components? Again, they're controls. There's things that are typically going to get done on a bunch of different web pages. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel and do them from scratch. You just have to take the component, plug it in your page, and configure it and get it to work for your particular environment. Now, you, now that's not going to do everything for you. But again, it's going to do a lot. These components are used to create two different kind of files. And I'm writing the extensions here, then I'll write the description. And an ASPX application, every page has associated with it two files. Now, it is possible to combine those two files into one, but we're not going to do that. So for our purposes, there's, there's always going to be two files. There's an ASPX file and an ASPX, in our case, CS file. CS standing for C sharp. Um, if we were doing VB coding, it would be ASPX.VB. All right, and this is a presentation or the appearance of the page. This is what's called the code behind or processing logic. So, for example, if we created a page to, you know, multiply two numbers together and give us the answer, all right, the form that would contain the two text boxes would be in the ASPX file. The button to go and do the calculation would be in the ASPX file. The logic that actually pulled the values from those two text boxes, multiplied them together, and displayed the result, maybe in a label on the page, would be in the code behind. So this relates to the presentation or appearance all right, of a page. This relates to um, the code behind, the processing logic behind the web page. And these two, bo both of these can use the .NET components. In addition, You can create your own custom components and extend the functionality of the .NET components. So, for example, the calendar component works in a certain way. All right. Let's say I wanted to take the calendar component and make a calendar for my organization that did everything that the calendar component does plus a couple other things. I wouldn't have to, again, reinvent the wheel. I could take the calendar component and extend it to have this new bits of functionality. So I can use those custom components in my pages as well. So, when I'm developing these, I'm not developing them from ground zero. I'm developing them using a framework and I can take that code to create my pages, create my processing code, and I'm given a head start. All right? In a nutshell, this is, again, this is responsible for the appearance of the page. This is responsible with, like, processing the stuff on the page and doing stuff with it. Yes? That seems to me like the user interface is 
Yeah, yeah, user interface would be another way to say that. So, what do these files look like? And, and we'll, we'll spend the rest of the semester looking like them, but I, I kind of want to preview it. All right. This file looks like an HTML file, right? Because HTML is a user interface. But it's sort of a souped up HTML file because we can include these .NET components. Things that aren't part of standard HTML, but that are part of the ASP.NET framework. So this is roughly analogous to an HTML file. In fact, we can include HTML in that. All right? And then augment that HTML with some of these .NET components. And this will all become clearer when we get uh, an example up. I just kind of want to kind of want to preview on it. When someone requests one of these pages, the web server takes the ASPX file, and if it's plain HTML, it just sends it right to the client. You could have, for example, a link tag, a plain old CISS216 link tag. Well, there's no translation needed to be done then. The web server simply sends that to the client. If it encounters one of these .NET components, though, what it does is it translates that .NET component into some combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. For example, if you can imagine, imagine if you were doing a calendar. You're doing a calendar for August. What would the calendar look like? You know, what HTML tags would you use? Well, it would be a table, right? It would have you know, four or five or six rows, seven columns. Yeah, seven columns. And it would have in the TDs the numbers of the, the, the day. You might have THs for the days of the week and then TDs for the, the, uh, uh, the, the specific days. Every one of you, I'm confident, could write one of these. You could sit down and you could create a table to display August 2012. All right, the date's in August 2012. I'm confident you could do it. All right. But how long would it take you? I don't know. You know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, I don't know, maybe longer. All right. With the ASP.NET component, since calendars are something that are certainly not rare, they may not be on every web page, but they're sure on a lot of web pages, all right, there's an ASP.NET component for a calendar. So I bring that ASP.NET component onto my ASPX page, which again is like a souped up HTML page. It's plain old HTML plus these high powered components. And then when the server processes that ASPX file, it takes that calendar control and generates the HTML necessary to create a calendar for August or for July or for September and so on. And again, it gets delivered to the browser in the form of some combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The code behind we're going to leave for now. We'll come back to it. I'm not sure if we're going to come back to it today or if we're going to come back to it, um, you know, at some point, you know, in that next class probably if we don't come back to it today. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm a little confused as to why it's called a framework if it's a set of components. Framework to me implies structure. Well, those components are structured in a certain way. Those components, it's not like, it's not like you have a bunch of components that are unrelated to each other. There's actually a hierarchy of components and a structure of components. You know, there are, for example, I'll give you one example, there are validator controls. Now, what do validator controls do? Well, they validate form fields. So, for example, you know, you type in a value, 